Chapter 4 Ritual The Call to Spirit It's important in any relationship to do ritual in order to keep peace, to ground ourselves, and to create better communication. There are rituals that help couples to reaffirm their purpose, to give their gifts to the community, and to address difficulties in the lives of others so that they are not just wrapped up in their own things. What is a ritual? A ritual is a ceremony in which we call in spirit to come and be the driver, the overseer of our activities. The elements of ritual allow us to connect with the self, the community, and the natural forces around us. In ritual, we call in spirit to show us obstacles that we cannot see because of our limitations as human beings. Rituals help us to remove blocks standing between us and our true spirit and other spirits. In the village, everybody is addicted to ritual. There, people experience intimacy not just with their partners, but with the rest of the village at all times, simply because of their repeated involvement with ritual. There's such a high from this that most conversations are about the ritual that just ended or about the need for the next one. Maybe that's why they don't have television. They need to be constantly involved in ritual because it's like an energy that gives a high that lasts perhaps three or four days, and as soon as they start coming down, everybody is concerned. They need the high again. You don't do a ritual just for the sake of doing a ritual. Every ritual must have a very specific purpose, a clearly stated intention. It must have something to resolve. There are personal rituals, community rituals, maintenance rituals, and radical rituals. Radical rituals are done to disassociate someone from a state of profound turmoil or alienation and reunite him with his spirit. They are done by a community for an individual or individuals. It is then necessary to do regular maintenance rituals in order for the effects of the ritual to continue. Take for instance a person who is very disconnected from himself, from his spirit. He doesn't need a maintenance ritual. He needs something radical to end that disconnection and bring the spirit back into himself so that he can start to be alive again. In such a ritual, the community must be there because a person becomes so vulnerable that he needs to contain sacred space held by other people who will make sure that he doesn't hurt himself. And also, the community must be there to welcome him back. Even though a person experiences a radical ritual, if he doesn't have an appropriate welcoming back, his psyche will take it as meaning that he did not do it right. He may have to go back and do it again. The psyche won't know the ritual has been successful without a community there to acknowledge that this is so. Every time you want to move into a ritual, you need to recognize that there's a whole line of ancestors behind you. There's a whole spirit world around you. There is the animal world, the ground world, the trees, and so forth. If you have a way of saying to these forces, come and be with us in such a way that we can feel and do such and such, then you're already in ritual. Next, you must state your purpose, being quite specific about your need or goals. Spirits are drawn to a place of activity, particularly activity that interests them and demands their involvement. All you need to do from then on is to go deep into your heart and listen to the rhythm of it. There is a language spoken to you by the beings you have called into your circle. The problem is, we usually don't listen enough, and therefore, we don't hear it. Usually. If you ask one spirit to come, it will not come alone. It gathers its friends, its relatives, friends of its friends, and so on. And all these spirits will come to you. You don't need a PhD or to suffer pain and contortions in order to attract them. All you really need is the sincerity of your heart and a willing ear. In the West, people tend to standardize everything. So if you describe one ritual, people think it applies to all situations. Even though every case is different, 
people will follow the same formula. In ritual, that doesn't work. A ritual has to be made specific to the people who are involved in it. And if you try to standardize things, you actually take away the spirit of the people and try to force something false into the situation. We think that someone must bring a secret book of ritual recipes so that if we have a toothache, we go to page 129, read paragraph 2, and that will take care of it. When in fact, we ourselves are page 129, paragraph 2. So I'm saying, trust in yourself. Believe in your ability to hear. Just say, I know these things exist somewhere in me. I remember growing up how one of my grandmothers used to involve us in ritual. She would create situations where we would have to come up with an appropriate ritual. She would never interfere with our creativity. All she would do was make sure that we were making progress. Just like a mother with a baby learning to walk, she would guide us a little, and when we fail, she would give us encouragement and strength to keep on trying. With any ritual, you start by preparing the sacred space and constructing a shrine. Then call in spirit with an invocation. It has to start with the setting of the intention and with a group of committed people who want the greatest good to happen. The people involved in a ritual are the only ones who can determine exactly what elements are needed. Rituals are not alike. They each have their own flavor. It would be best to look at each situation with care, then determine the elements that are needed. The fun comes when everybody adds an ingredient here and there. In this way, a ritual is like a meal where everybody brings an ingredient. Some people bring onions, some people bring tomatoes, some people bring lettuce or celery or pepper or chili and so on. After gathering all the elements, then you look and see which ingredients work best. A ritual begins when you define a ritual space. You can delineate a ritual space with ash, leaves, or stones, or sometimes just by building a shrine. Select a place where you can build a shrine and light candles. Take ash and make a circle as big as you think it needs to be. It could be a small circle for two people to sit in and communicate for conflict resolution, or a big space to include many people. The ash can be from any burnt wood, preferably free of nails or any kind of chemical. Because ash is connected to fire, it provides protection. It helps when calling in the spirits and helps people connect. It prevents negative energies from creeping in while you're in ritual. Your shrine should be made of items that symbolize something good for you and relate to the purpose of the ritual. It should be made beautiful. You could use such things as candles, water, flowers, textiles, masks, or pictures. In a ritual done for a relationship, it is sometimes useful to set up a couple shrine and a personal shrine. A couple shrine will have elements contributed by both people, and the personal shrine will be designed by the individual. In the Dagada tribe, we would use colors such as blue, black, red, yellow, green, and white for the shrine. These colors represent, res respectively, water, fire, earth, nature, and mineral. Dagara people don't distinguish between blue and black. We would use rocks to represent the mineral kingdom, leaves for the nature kingdom. The skull in a relationship ritual represents death and memory. Green leaves represent life. We would bring in water to represent peace, the state of peace we would like to have in our life. Soil would symbolize nurturing, groundedness, a sense of identity, and support. Fire would be represented by ash, blood, something red to symbolize our connection to the ancestors. Bones and rocks mean communication and our ability to remember. Depending on our needs, one or more of these elements would be used in a ritual. So, if it's a ritual for peace, for example, you can use blue or black candles, some water, 
and other items that say peace to you. If the ritual is for nurturing or groundedness or working on the identity of a relationship, you would use yellow candles and soil. If you're working on communication or making sure that you interpret correctly the signs you receive from your partner, you choose a white candle, rocks, and bones. If you are working on connecting with the spirit of the ancestors or keeping the spiritual connection in your relationship, you would use red candles. Fire, you know, brings warmth, action, and compassion. It helps a couple to dream together. But I tell people to be sure that their intention is set absolutely right and clear for the use of red because the velocity of fire can quickly degenerate into war. Then, if you're looking for magic to help you go through major changes or let's say a couple is starting to put on masks before the community, acting insincerely and presenting their false side, green candles and fabrics are used along with masks, which represents the great mystery and anything else that reminds one of nature. These elements of ritual are to be taken simply as a source of inspiration, particularly for those who do not have a background in ritual. Now that you have your space delineated, your shrine ready, and the purpose of the ritual determined and clearly expressed to the spirits and ancestors, you can help the person for whom the ritual is designed. You might say that now the ritual starts. But in fact, the ritual started when people first gathered to figure things out and began, with the guidance of spirit, to prepare the ritual space. 